Hello and welcome to Newsweek. On April 11th, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange was forcibly arrested from the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Assange now faces extradition to the United States, where he may face a grand jury indictment on charges of espionage. To talk more about some of the developments in the case, we have with us Prabir Pagan. Hello, Prabir. Prabir, so on the one hand, this is initially, of course, the British police said that this was about jumping bail. But later, everyone involved accepted that this was actually about a U.S. extradition request. And the U.S. is clearly framing this as a case of espionage, using the Computer Fraud Act and other instances. But uh, I, I think one of the things that they're uh, willing to ignore is the fact that this is also an issue of journalism. And this is something that needs to be discussed in some length. So could you talk a bit about this? First, is let's look about where the legal case is. We have to see, as we have discussed with today with Renata earlier, that the case is not going to be that simple. Even if the U.S. wants to uh, get him back to the U.S., right. get him to the U.S., in fact, correctly, or the U.K. wants to hand him over. There is going to be a legal issue over there. There's going to be proceedings. We'll see what is the extent or how it will actually happen, how, what is going to take place. The second issue that you were raising, that uh, is it that uh, apart from the issue of press freedom, the second issue that we are talking about is the what is the charge that has been framed. And you are saying that it is a basically a spionage versus computer fraud, etc., etc. Now, it's linked really to the question that you're raising about press freedom. Did he conspire to hack into, quote unquote, US secret documents? Or did he accept what the whistleblower, in this case, Chelsea Manning, was willing to hand over? to WikiLeaks, the documents which were there in the US government uh, confidential repository, whatever. Right. Now, all accounts, it was Chelsea Manning who was the whistleblower. She was the, who, the one who had access. And she is the one who handed over these documents to WikiLeaks for publication. Did the publication serve public good? Yes. It showed clear instances of war crimes, uh, even clear videos which show how journalists were shot down on the ground. It shows civilians being killed and a wealth of documents, how different countries' laws were violated and how uh, war crimes were committed by U.S. troops, both in Iraq as well as in Afghanistan. So this was the nobody's questioning that this served a public purpose, mm -hmm. which was war crimes or crimes against the people of different parts of the world. So the question that arises, should the uh, what would be called the press freedoms be extended to WikiLeaks? And there's been a whole argument saying that, well, you know, it's really not uh, press because it is not print, it is not television. We know that if that is an argument, then a number of newspapers which have folded up today and are only have a digital presence would also be considered as not press. That's the, not the argument anybody is giving. So digital platforms as press is now widely accepted. There is no argument that if you are a media organization, what form you practice your media uh, presence, whether it should be print television or it should be uh, digital platforms, that's really not the issue. The issue is, are you really performing the traditional function of press, of informing the people of what's the news and what's the wrongdoing of those in power? And if we take that into account, WikiLeaks certainly performed that role. And therefore, the argument that WikiLeaks is not press is a completely spurious one. Right. So I think it's a new form of journalism which WikiLeaks has really brought about. It started with exposure of corruption. In fact, initial letter that Julian had written to different people in the world asking for the support talked about corruption in the developing countries because he didn't think that the problem was in the United States or in uh, European, Western European countries. He thought this was a peculiarly third world problem. The governments are corrupt. They violate human rights and therefore they need to be exposed. In fact, it was his experience with what happened, Iraq war, particularly being an eye-opener, that forced him to rethink his politics and the understanding that the biggest violator of human rights is actually the United States and other NATO 
countries. And the fact that a lot of these crimes happen in quote-unquote third world countries or developing countries is because of the, uh, shall we say, the direct interests of the U.S. and the U.S. big corporations or Western European big corporations. Therefore, this is not a case of corruption of just simply third world dictators enriching themselves, but it's a far bigger issue than that. And picking up on one of the points you said in terms of a new model of journalism, so what Julian Assange and WikiLeaks actually brought was the possibility that uh, information, even raw information, could actually be used as a weapon by people who hitherto had absolutely no access to it. And that has actually in some senses created a revolution because after that Snowden came with his own a bit of information and there have been many such instances across the world. Well, it's not really a bit. It's a huge cache of information out of which we don't know how much we have seen and how right. much we have still to right. see. You know, there, there are I think two major issues uh, or changes. Uh, I would hesitate to use the word revolution because a much misused word which WikiLeaks really brings in. One is it makes the possibility of transmitting large amounts of information from the one who is a whistleblower to the one who is fun functioning as, shall we say, the press or the media to expose these documents to the public. Now, this used to be, as we know, a very cloak and dagger operation. We have the uh, Woodward and Bernstein case of the Watergate uh, leaks with a deep throat, Mark Felt, who was associate director of FBI, apparently communicating by Bernstein moving a flower pot in his balcony and Mark Felt then marking up the place they would meet on the copy of his New York Times, the 20th page, if I remember correctly. Now, all of this was very, very difficult. And if you're going to supply bulk documents, obviously this was not a very, shall we say, efficient use particularly with cell phones and all other means of surveillance today that we have, this is increasingly a difficult way to operate. So what, it, uh, what Julian did, because he was a very high-end programming person, he created a mechanism by which whistleblowers could transfer documents to WikiLeaks without actually WikiLeaks knowing about who the supplier of the information was. They, of course, had to do the due, due diligence. Was it true? Was it correct? It's not every document which WikiLeaks uh, got it published. It didn't. But after having done that, they could say with confidence that we do not know who the person is who has sent us these documents. We've received the documents. Something that Bernstein always said, that he didn't know who was the deep throat. Of course, we know that he really did. But he could have plausible deniability. In this case, you could have technological deniability because the secure Dropbox kind of platforms, the Dropboxes that he engineered, various other modes of communication that he really made popular, at least the circuit, made, or as he puts it, cryptography becoming democratic, that others could use it. It's just not just the state. And you could also Therefore, communicate with the platforms like WikiLeaks without compromising who you are. And of course, if people are not careful, then of course you still can get caught. And uh, Charlie, uh, if you take Chelsea Manning's case, it was not the communication that right. came public that that of to send to WikiLeaks that made her. Uh, that identified her, but it was really her speaking to someone else who then acted as a snitch. So it's also interesting because especially the uh, Iraq and the Afghanistan cables were not a WikiLeaks operation alone. It was the entire media ecosystem across continents, even in India for that matter, the cables that were released were along with the mainstream media. So We have also seen, for instance, the other papers, Paradise Papers and various other things becoming used in a similar fashion. Right. So I think what has really happened is journalism has changed dramatically with WikiLeaks. But this is something which, uh, you know, is people are unwilling to admit right. because, shall we say, they don't like Julian Assange or what he was doing. Or if you're a Democrat in the United States, you believe Assange helped uh, Trump win and so on. But the other thing was, if you talk about the technological finesse that uh, WikiLeaks showed, it was an amazing one because they were sort of dropped from all the uh, servers that are available, commercially available, money was stopped and so on. And they created 
huge number of instances through which WikiLeaks still was available to the people. Right. And therefore, they were able to beat what people thought would be a very difficult exercise, right. being able to function right. without the U.S. stopping them. Mm -hmm. So all the attempts that U.S. made to stop them, actually they could not help, uh, they could really stop it because of the technical finesse or the technical capability the WikiLeaks has it had or Julian had. And so you would see, for instance, the attack on WikiLeaks as a fundamental attack on the freedom of press and the media expression across the world. I have no doubt that it is because what we are talking about is something which is exposed by, exposed by Chelsea Manning. She served a sentence in jail for this. If anybody can be accused by the United States of having breached their security, it was Chelsea Manning. She was a whistleblower. And she was punished for this, and that could be argued was the only person the government can hold responsible. Can the press be held responsible for publishing it? I think the answer is clear. If that was so, Washington Post, New York Times, Guardian, all of them should also be put to jail. Why is it that only, only WikiLeaks? What's the specific crime that WikiLeaks has committed, which Washington Post, New York Times, or a Guardian has it? And Washington Post, as you know, was the Watergate case. Right. So why is it that we are saying, well, that was different, but this is not. Right. After all, you are talking of crimes committed by the US and Iraq and Afghanistan, and these are war crimes. Thank you. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching News Click.